So I've picked some history books that I think are fairly representative of how societies and civilizations have changed and developed over time. Now the stack that I have picked is quite big, so I don't know if I'll have time to get to all of them, and in which case I'll make a part two, but let's get into the books. So this book is a story or history of civilization that takes a macro perspective in the same way that macroeconomics takes a macro perspective. It looks strictly speaking at macro variables. Now, what are some of these macro variables? One thing he considers is enduring structures. For example, the Nile River. It's not just the geography of the Nile River that he considers. He considers how the Nile River has been exploited and used to support civilizations, for example, like ancient Egypt. Another thing he'll do is look at the influences and interplays between economics, politics, and religion or slash culture. For example, he considers how mercantilism in the Renaissance era actually resulted in cultural shifts or cultural changes being brought to Europe that wouldn't have otherwise been brought. Another thing he considers is both geography, or like geopolitics, and time. But when he means time, he means uh, age of innovation. For example, the discovery of the compass in conjunction with, say, the Normans living on a coast led to the invasion of England. Uh, simply the geography and the time had an interplay with one another to result in a, in a very unique kind of development. And you could say the same thing about oil-rich countries. Before the discovery of oil, these countries were able to prosper more because we didn't think that they had a large amount of natural resources. But once we discovered oil, all of a sudden these oil-rich countries became targets for great powers. The next book is a pretty popular book. It's a book about debt that goes over the history of debt in its relationship to cultural change or political change or even religious change. For instance, the author starts off with Mesopotamia. In Mesopotamia, debt forgiveness during economic unrest was a pretty big part of their culture. And rulers at the time, in a way, as a way to gain favor, would engage in debt forgiveness to avoid social unrest. Another important area in the book goes over debt relationships between nations. In history, there's a lot of instances where bigger nations would give debt to smaller nations, but it wasn't as a way to develop them economically. It was, strictly speaking, a way to control both their foreign and domestic politics. And he also explores some modern stuff as well that I thought was pretty interesting. He goes over the Arab Springs and provides an analysis that I beforehand wouldn't have considered. He looked at the level of uh, student unemployment and student debt, and the students of the Arab Springs actually had a lot of debt, which he argues contributed to their uh, uprising. So this book is a history of philosophy book by Grayling that is a bit better than a lot of the other history of philosophy books because it goes over more than just Western thought. It goes all the way down to the pre-Socratics, but also Confucius philosophy as well. It doesn't just stick to Western philosophy. After exploring worldviews like Confucianism, Taoism, or pre-Socratic thought, he develops a connection between the various types of philosophies that have evolved over time. For instance, Grayling believes that virtue ethics, which is an ancient philosophy, has actually had a massive impact on modern moral philosophy or modern moral beliefs. Now, I will say there have been a lot of history of philosophy books, but if you're going to pick one of them, this is probably going to be the best one, short of buying the 13-volume or 12-volume cobblestone collection. So this next book, The Ascent of Money, is by one of my favorite authors, Neil Ferguson. I have many of his books. They're all very good. And this book is a history of finance. Now, one of the things he does inside this book is a pretty standard thing to do in the history of finance, which is to look at the origins of money. He traces it back to the Tang Dynasty. I've seen some authors argue differently, but he basically examines how this currency came about in the Tang Dynasty and how it facilitated trade. It basically gave a real-time example of the famous uh, thought experiment that Adam Smith gives about how it's easier to trade if you have a common medium of exchange, whereas if you're trading, say, six pieces of wood for two pieces of meat, it's very hard to get equivalent value. He also considers important financial innovations, such as the Dutch East India Trading Company or the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. Both of these institutions, or you could say companies, uh, changed the way that investment and trade was done on the international stage. And another really important area that he looks at is the relationship between finance and politics, which is a pretty important and heavily connected thing. He looks at, as an example, British bonds and how the British bonds helped fund the British during the war. If it wasn't for the bonds, the British wouldn't have been able to wage war. The next book is The Penguin History of Economics, which looks at how economics has changed over time. It doesn't have the explicit goal of comparing it to society, but it does look at how different societies have changed their economic policies. The first little part of the book goes over economic theorists and how they shaped economic foundations. For example, Adam Smith, Ricardo, or Alfred Marshall. 
Another thing it does is it looks at the change in economic paradigms in response to societal changes. For example, there was a time and point where economists wanted to explain consumer behavior, and they had a really hard time doing this. And economists came along and invented the concept, or invented the concept called marginal utility, which helped explain consumer behavior. The concept of marginal utility being you get a diminished return in utility from buying three Cokes, whereas if you only buy two Cokes. In other words, the dollar value is greater to half for buying two Cokes as opposed to buying three Cokes. And then lastly, but also fairly importantly, is it looks at how economic thought has shaped and influenced institutions. You can go for the example of the monetary, monetary theory or Keynes. Uh, Keynes had a big impact on international financial institutions. And even uh, Karl Marx it has a massive impact in our ordinary politics, yet alone economic institutions. So this next book is Civilization, the West and the Rest by Neil Ferguson, which is a comparative comparative history book that looks at different civilizations in relationship to the East. It looks at how Western civilizations have prospered or have declined in relationship to the rest of the rest of the world. For example, one thing he looks at is military, economic, and technological innovations in the West and how they allowed for colonialization or imperialism of both Asia and Africa, and even to some extent the Balkans. Another thing he does that I thought was pretty cool is look at how Philosophical ideas, such as ideas from the Enlightenment, impacted the governance structures of various institutions inside Western nations and compared them to other nations outside of the West. In fact, he does this for a lot of categories. Now I'll read some of them from the table of contents for you to get a better idea. He compares nations in competition, in science, in property, in medicine, consumption, and work. He basically goes over all of those categories and provides a comparative analysis between Western nations and other nations and draws conclusions from that. The last book to discuss is The Great Divergence, China, Europe, and the Making of the Modern World Economy. The idea behind this book is to look at Europe and China and look at the economic development and the disparities between the two nations that resulted in the economic development that they have now. Uh, one of the things he says fairly early on is that China was a bit more resource rich for the demands that it had at the time. And so it didn't need to engage in international trade or trade between nations. In addition to that, Europe was silver rich at the time, which was a pretty important resource. And so that also contributed to Europe wanting to engage in trade, but also prospering a little bit more. And the last thing that is worth mentioning is he talks about how imperialism or colonialism resulted in the Europe, European nations having a better time with trade because they established trade partners early on, even if they oppressed them. So I didn't get to all of the books, and because I don't want this video to be too long, I won't explain much about the next two books, but they're basically honorable mentions. The first one is The Penguin History of the 20th Century. This is a great book that goes over the 20th century. It's fairly exhaustive, and I think it's actually quite accurate. The next one is The Mukadima. This book is technically a sociology book, but is a historical sociology book, and is one of the first sociology books ever written. And it doesn't get mentioned much in mainstream sociology, which is why it's on this list. So those are some of the books that I think are a great way to understand how civilizations and societies have changed over time. If you have any recommendations for me, let me know below and I will check them out. But with that being said, guys, bye-bye.